Hey, Frank. How are things going at the shops today? Glad to see you, sir. Just business as usual. Progress on the current batch of C30-7As is coming along well, with work projected to start for the next batch order from Conrail, set to begin in a few weeks. Glad to hear it. Seeing that it's the middle of June, we should have all of our interns in by now. How are they working out? Well, we actually just had our last intern listed for the program start work today. I must say, he is a bit of a train nut. He talks a lot about railroad history, his own fictional railroads, and even his own locomotive designs. So, hopefully that should help us with better building newer engine- What on earth are you doing? <laughs> it's alive! Oh, hey Frank! Hello, Mr. Boss, sir! During the lunch break, I decided to convert this engine to run electricity instead of diesel since everyone is talking about electrification nowadays, and I decided to go to the line of trade-ins and take an RS3 since that's an Alco engine instead of a GE one, and it's also harder to come by nowadays ever since Alco shut down. I also wasn't sure what livery I should paint it in since several liveries were used for test engines and leasers, so I decided to paint it in the livery of one of my fictional railroads, namely the Lake Geary and Richards Bay Railroad, and I also decided to number it the year it was converted, namely 1977, since EMD did the same thing for their two electric engines, 1975 and 1976. I'm still working on connecting the electricity to the traction motors in addition to the prime mover, but I can tell at least some energy is drawn when connected to the wires, based on the number boards lighting up. So what do you guys think of this creation that I made? No. You're hired. The 1970s was a tough time to be a railroad. Constant competition from cars and planes resulted in low revenue, merger mania, terrible track quality, and exponentially higher fuel prices due to the oil embargo on the US. The last of these points specifically caused several railroads to look into getting rid of oil entirely as a fuel source, with the oil embargo having no end in sight at the time which prompted a vast array of mainline and locomotive electrification programs, long before the several calls to put up the wires since the 2000s. Some companies even went as far as to build their own electric locomotives in anticipation of mass electrification, with others either proposing their own variants of electric engines, or proposing to convert existing diesel engines into electric-powered ones. Despite none of these expansive electrification plans ever coming to reality due to oil prices eventually stabilizing, one locomotive was in fact converted from diesel to electric for these previous plants. Except, it's not a locomotive that one would expect. This engine was originally built as a road switcher in the 1950s by a company that was long out of business at the time of its conversion, as it was painted in the livery of a non-existent railroad and never left the testing facility where it was traded in. This is the story of Lake Erie and Richmond Bay number 1977 also known as the Converted Electric Alco. Technically, there are several classes of Alco engines that ran on overhead wires long before the locomotive to be focused on was built. As Alco often worked with Westinghouse and General Electric to construct massive electric engines to pull passenger and freight trains through the tunnels. Because it had zero emissions, the electric engine would be swapped out for a steam engine on each end of the tunnel, so this way the smoke from the steam engine wouldn't suffocate the crew and passengers. But with the introduction of the diesel locomotive, electric engines were phased out and the wires were torn down, as diesels were seen as low enough emissions to run through a tunnel just fine without justifying the need for a time-intensive engine swap, in addition to the cost of keeping and maintaining overhead wires and the engines that only run on said wires. This was during a time where overhead wires was just seen as a means of keeping steam engines stood out of areas where they could harm the crew, instead of being looked into further as a clean and powerful form of energy, as they are today in the rest of the world. But for the next several decades, diesel would be king of the rails. Alco was no exception to this trend, as they shifted their production of engines from steam and the occasional electric over to diesel, with one of their most successful models being the RS3, or Road Switcher Model 3, which was designed as an all-in-one locomotive that could be used for switching and mainline freight runs. Equipped with an open walkway, smooth edges, and a cab with clear visibilities over the short and long hoods, these were the go-to engines on most rosters of railroads large and small, as over 1,400 RS3s were built over the span of six years, with some still in use to this day. One of the much lesser known railroads to roster this class of engines was the Missouri-Illinois Railroad, a subsidiary of the Missouri Pacific that used the Mopac livery, who purchased 14 RS3s to use as their primary power to replace steam with the locomotive to be focused on, number 70, being built in 1954. 
Like the rest of the RS3's build, number 70 served a wide range of jobs on its home railroad well, as the engine was later renumbered to 969, but not even 10 years after they were built, Missouri Pacific decided to rebuild their RS3 with EMD 567 prime movers and reclassified them as the GP12. Number 969 received this upgrade and was renumbered to 1073 as it was repainted into the more recognizable solid blue livery that could be seen on other parts of the system. But just a few years later, Alco announced it would be ceasing operations in 1969, which resulted in any Alco products on active rosters after that point being made obsolete, with parts becoming harder to come by. Not wanting to risk running out of parts for their Alcos, and in favor of receiving newer and stronger engines, Mopac traded in 1073 along with a handful of other RS3s to General Electric in 1974, likely in exchange for brand new U23Bs. From here, most of the ex Mopac RS3s were stored, with some being used as occasional GECX leaser engines, but at the same time, the oil used for fueling old and new diesels alike was becoming expensive, as many railroads were now seriously considering purchased new or converted electric engines. Countless studies were being made to not only electrify mainlines, but to also design brand new electric engines in addition to converting them from existing diesels, as UP already electrified some parts of their mainline in anticipation of electric engines. GE had the upper hand to try out such technologies, since they already had experience with building electric engines in the past with Alco and Westinghouse, as well as more recently with building and maintaining electric engines in EMUs for Conrail and Amtrak on the already electrified Northeast Corridor, in addition to the handful of E60Cs for newly electrified freight service in the Southwest. And besides, it's in the name, General Electric. In order to further develop their electric engine experience, GE took on one of several worn down trade-ins and did the unthinkable. They removed the long hood, gave it a boxy nose similar to their E44s, and most shockingly, they gave the RS3 a panagraph, thus making it the first and so far only American locomotive to be converted from diesel to electric. Unusually, it was also given a blue and white livery with the name Lake Erie and Richmond Bay instead of GE likely because this engine was rebuilt at GE Siri plant just outside of Lake Erie, and it was also renumbered to 1977, representing the year that the electric engine was converted, just like EMD's two new built electric engines. With this massive rebuild, 1977 was used as a testbed for Conrail's electrics, as well as Arrow EMUs for the Northeast Corridor commuter services, with those two classes often being photographed with 1977 the most although there's no record as to whether this testbed was utilized anywhere outside of the plant. But while railroads and manufacturers were continuing to design massive proposals for electrification, oil prices were starting to come back down, as the U.S. was practically recovered from the oil embargoes by the early 80s. Around this time, railroads were more interested in purchasing stronger diesel engines rather than building expensive electrification projects and with them new build or convert electric engines. Because of this, the unique electric test bed was simply stored on the deadline in the Erie plant for several years, with there being little to no photos of its time in testing service until the one-of-a-kind converted engine was finally sold for scrap in 1995. Even if this engine was never utilized as anything more than a platform to test electrical equipment, it still serves as the only tangible example of the result of a major aspect of electrification plants from the 70s by utilizing the least expecting engine to be converted. Never before had a decades-old locomotive from a defunct manufacturer been chosen to be converted from diesel power to run on overhead electric wires in anticipation of future diesel-to-electric rebuilds, as this marks one of, if not the only time, a diesel was converted to run on overhead wires. And what an odd but great engine to use as a prototype. Thank you all for watching. Credit for all the photos used go to their respective photographers. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, subscribe for more. Have a good day.